not been quite as beautifully illustrated as I would hope, um, because some of them might be slightly overcooked by the time you get to taste them. But what I really want to talk about was how um, this language joins up with our language, because I think over time, um, and particularly recently, there's been this thing about with recipes, chucking a handful of this and pouring a look at that, um, you know, use a big potato, that sort of thing. And to be honest, I think it's just lazy. Because what a recipe needs to be, first and foremost, is a series of instructions. If you want to keep it loose, or you want to add some romance, you want to add some excitement to it, for me, that needs to come in the introduction. That's where that is. A recipe itself is a series of instructions. And if you, I've had now 18 years experience teaching people how to cook. And the language that really worries me is, I've got lucky mash. It's gluey, I'm potatoes are waterlogged. Why do my bowl potatoes break up? The, my roasties are dry, chips are oily, sauté is stick to the pan, roasties is soggy and sticky. This is the language that really concerns me because what happens when we when we publish a recipe, whether it be in any of the so many different ways that's available to us these days, is that it's not just giving something something for people to read. What happens is these people, and I've dealt with thousands upon thousands of them over the years, these people they get a recipe, they really want to do it. It's not just reading it, enjoying it, or reading it, not enjoying it, putting it away. It's reading it, bless you. This is an interesting thing, actually. If you don't say bless you when someone sneezes, what happens? Your soul goes up and parts into two. If someone doesn't say bless you, it doesn't join back together again. So it's actually a very important thing to do. And while I think for you guys, because I'm looking at you four across there, you two are going to come help me in a second. What you need to know about is pseudo cream. It's a cream that you rub on before the service or before the day's work, and it completely stops you getting chef's ass. It's a wonderful thing to know about. If you, 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 I know very well. You, 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 you know, I was talking to the four in front of you actually because I thought they might not have the experience yet. I didn't discover it until I had kids, and so I had something like 15 years of chef's ass to deal with. Okay, good. Anyway, back to the spots. So, people are reading the recipe, and then they're taking the time, they're going and buying the ingredients, they're spending the money on their eggs, they're taking the time to do that. Then they're coming home, and they're doing it. And if it's not working, it's something that really, really bothers me. And what it speaks to, too, is their confidence and their willingness to try people's recipes again. So if we don't get it right in that way, we don't give them enough instruction, there's no point keeping it completely loose until, unless you're talking to people that you know, know that. And that's my opinion. I had um, I had 10 years of working with Delia Smith, I'm doing cooking workshops with her at the Paris Center Cooking Club. And there, I met, and literally as well, because we had 120 people at a time, thousands of people who did her recipes and who trusted them completely, who sent their kids off to school with her ragu recipe or her, um, or some of the complicated pasta roulade was one of them, you know, things like this. But um, they trusted them completely because she tests them back to front and sideways, because she works in teaspoons and tablespoons. You know, this whole thing of, of you know, being loose about it, throwing stuff in, putting a handful of mint in something, it tastes like toothpaste, it's horrendous. And this brings me back now to the potatoes, the language that I'm talking about here. I can never remember any of this. It's like cheeses. I can never remember the names of cheeses. Grandma, I can't, I don't get it. Grandma, cheese is the names of potatoes. So having that handy, for me, is a very good idea. Um, so, uh, the only thing I wasn't sure about is where, where mash should go with the fluffy of the spoon. That was the one that I could, couldn't, couldn't quite get to. So what I'm going to try and do tonight is just to show you um, various different things with one extreme and another. We're going to do some mash, we're going to do some roasties, we're going to do some cinnamon and boiled potatoes, we're going to do some sauteed potatoes, we're going to do some salad potatoes, and that's about it for now. So, what I've asked um, for the Taylor Council to provide me with is within the four sort of general varieties that are normal, the four varieties that we you know, get most of all, so Desiree, Charlotte, King Edward, and Maris Piper, that I could cope with tonight. So four I could just about manage. Um, so trying a recipe with one and with another. The one that we're going to start with, um, so Stephen and Jeff, I need you to now, is mash. Now the thing about mash, when you're saying, you know, boil up some potatoes, for one thing, a potato should never be boiled. We talk about this all the time, and this is the thing about doing recipes and testing recipes. Potatoes should never be boiled. If you boil up a potato, it's a terrible thing. They should be simmered. So already that part of the language is wrong. And this is just something that we go on and on. This is something that drives me crazy about a lot of recipes. There's so much yet to be discovered. Yet we keep saying the same things. We keep repeating the same things. Like if we're going to do a roast chicken, let's find something new to set up. Let's find a new way of doing the gravy. Let's find a new way of making it flavorful. So. Here, I have um, done uh, a bit of, because also working on a hot plate like this when you haven't done so for a while, they call it, in, the, in, Fr in France they call this a piano. And the thing about this is that the, the, the heat's different all the way over. It's a clay sort of insert, the thing. So you play it like a piano, you move things backwards and forwards. The trouble is over time I got slightly too much in here and I kind of lost my sheet music. So what we're going to do here, 
we've got some mash that we're going to do. Here I've got some desire, which is the de desirable potato. So I'm just going to strain these, and then these are really slightly overcooked by now, but I'm not too worried about that. Over here we've got some charlottes, which are less than desirable. Okay, so I'm just going to pop those here. See, give that a shake. Oh, that's got no, that's got no, that's not Now, the thing about doing the mash, in the first place, what you have to be careful of, at this point, you need to tell your people, at this point, they need to have some hot milk at the ready, because what you don't want to do, as soon as the potatoes are drained, you don't want to leave them sitting there, they'll get a starchy surface. I know it's Dr. Mike, they're, they're uh, not next, so that, that's a good sign. Okay, so you're going to get the really hard one. Actually, no, Steve, you were cheating before. You're going to get the really hard one, and you're, you're, you're going to get the easy one there. Okay? So this, there, no, that's the hard one. This is the easy one over here. So pop them over there, Steve. So the different things you can mash. With. This you never get a smooth mash. It's kind of fine. You know, it's kind of rustic and good, and it gives it bang, and it's much simpler than dealing with anything else. This. It's a bit like a garlic press for me. I never have that much luck with it, but I know some people do. What I prefer is a sieve. So I tend to use a sieve at home, at the back of a ladle. Okay, so you don't necessarily have to have one of these things like these kids. Got a sieve at the back of a ladle like that, and you just pop them through. But the trick is, of course, you can't put it all in and hope to do it really quickly. You put it in and up five goes, and each one goes through quickly because you're not pressing down on too much. So you do that. Hi guys. We've got a few visitors there. It's like being in the zoo. So you do it about five goes. These guys here, they just take a, a bit of the potatoes, not too much at a time, and just push them through the sieve like that. Okay? You do that as well. So that's the first bit. The next bit, having the milk hot, having the butter ready. Also, there's a lot of different schools that thought about how, how you should mix it and everything. So guys, and when you do it, you don't need to do it lots of times, right? You just need to pop it down onto the sieve. One, two, three. It's a bit like sawing. When you saw him, I saw that with Ted the other day. And when you saw, you have to go shh, long strokes like that. It's much, much quicker. Her name was Mitz. She was a beautiful Oxford Sandia flag. Okay, so they're going through there. I'm going to leave them doing that for a little bit. Obviously, the ones on the left there, the Charlottes, are going to be more difficult to do. So first of all, choosing the right variety. Obviously, that's massively important. Here, these, this is a bit waterlogged, okay? Because I've been moving this on and off and carrying on. Ideally, you don't have that going on, okay? You cook them to the point. But if anything, you, are you overcooked? It's vital. Because if you undercook them, you just end up with a starchy mess. You've got too much on there, so then you might have a few less on, and you'll find it much easier. Then you have your milk ready, so the hot milk goes on, so that it combines very easily, after which time you fold in your butter. Okay, and it really is as simple as that. And this is the thing about, um, about these recipes for mashed potato. There's a lot of whole things, whether you use some sort of machine, whether you really overcomplicate things. No, you don't. You boil them to the right point, choose the right variety, boil them to the right point, have everything ready before you start mashing. But then, you're right with the thing, because there are some recipes now, for example, a very, very famous recipe for mashed potato that uses wrapped potatoes. And it's, it's basically um, it's nearly equal quantities of potatoes and butter. So it's probably, probably not one that we're going to share necessarily, but there are other options. You see how here, this has gone through this beautifully and very, very easily. And if you get rid of that, remember anything with that one, you can just leave it here, please. Here, you're going to pop, pop sorry. Yes, please. Here, you just pop in your hot milk, okay, which you've got to be ready. Then, it's not all about mixing. You just take a spatula, fold, and then I've got the butter, which is weighed out here. This is not necessarily meant to be melted. It's just that I turned the salamander on. There's nothing underneath, so it melted everything that's um, under there. Thank you very much, Jess. Well done. Good. So at this stage, you see Steve's still going here. That's exactly the same weight of potatoes, by the way, that we're dealing with here. And here you just fold it through, and that's it. Your mashed potato done. Okay? You can obviously add more butter if you want to, but you don't have to. Okay, so Steve, you carry on there for the next little while, and your your mix actually dry enough, so I'll just give you a touch more. Okay, so everyone there on the mash? All good, lovely. Moving on now to the roasties. Now, roasties, it's a funny old thing, because I don't really like the English way of making roast potatoes. The best ones that I've ever had was a Sunday lunch at a pub, and I just had them, it was so delicious, and I went and asked the guy how he'd done them, because I wanted to use the, um, use the recipe, and he deep fried them. <laughs> <laughs> I love these are fantastic, classic, crispy, delicious, they're deep fried. And that's no word of a liar. Because often I find they're the thing that, they're the thing that, for a domestic recipe, for me, it's very hard to give across a domestic recipe when you're offering something that needs to be eaten at a really exact point. Because that's what roast potatoes are all about. You get them right at the exact point and they're brilliant. But, if they're not quite there, or they sit around for a little while, not so good. 
super. Another interesting thing here, how are you going there, mate? You're done, well done. And you see, the thing about this is that it's not your sticky, okay, you're going to finish that off with me, guys. And what you're going to do too, now remembering the hair that you're sitting at, um, you're doing this for a, a lot of very esteemed food writers here, you're going to be in charge of the seasoning. <laughs> seasoning, I'm absolutely passionate about. This is a vital thing that you know about. The seasoning is not just seasoning is not just about adding a little bit of salt and pepper. Seasoning is about this constant thing of tasting. And when you're doing this, encouraging people to taste all the time. And seasoning not necessarily is salt and pepper because for all these different things, I do sometimes recipes with um, potatoes and apple where I use cinnamon as the seasoning instead of pepper. There's tons of things that you can do like that. In Roshni's like this, you can use something like chili, you can use curry powder, which is extraordinarily good. There's lots of great recipes with curry and potatoes. So think about it like that. But you guys, you need to add that now, Steve, yeah. and fold it in. Um, you're, you're done, you're done. You're, you'll work there as done, that's fantastic. Your next job is gonna be on the mandolin. So if you just hang on for a second with that. Okay, so the roast is here. The two varieties that we've got are King Edward and Desiree. Now, the ideal variety, I've been told, is the King Edwards. And the not so ideal, and I noticed it wasn't like a bad variety, was it? It was just not so ideal. So not quite so ideal, because it's probably gonna be yummy anyway. It's Desiree. The next thing, these, I'll just get, I'm just putting some fat in my trays in here. This oven here has been the cause of such drama today, you wouldn't believe. You know how ovens, when they used to have dials, has anyone got one like that? This uh -huh. is more complicated than my computer, or my phone, or anything like that. And I can't, it's on a bit too high a temperature, but three times I've tried to adjust the temperature, and it's all gone do lally, so I don't dare, okay? So. Okay, you know how? Yeah. Oh, Steve knows how. Can you turn it down by 10 degrees, please? Yeah. You would have thought that um, 26 years now experience working with food since I was nine. Um, I'd be able to cope with another. Okay, so when I was testing for everybody every day, and I did heaps of these roast potatoes because I wanted to kind of find the um, the thing that was meant to be so special about these roast potatoes. Something that I found was very, very interesting that I did was that I did the same variety, and some of them I boiled and drained and tossed. You know how you meant to scuff the outsides a little bit. Some of them I boiled for the same length of time, that were the same potatoes, and I drained, and I didn't scuff the outsides, and some of them I put in the oven raw. And by the time we were done, you couldn't really tell the difference. And what was extremely interesting was that the raw ones cooked at roughly the same time as the other ones. Of course, because you didn't have to deal with all the water that was inside them in the first place. And I think that that's a really fascinating thing, because the potatoes that I really love roasted is all the sort of French style of roasted potatoes, which I suppose are a bit more like wedges that you have. But I like to do them. I like to start them off from raw, and then I like to add some of the fat from whatever roast I'm having to finish them off cooking it. So, over here in um, HM, and I'll bring the trays over here. So, what you need to do, and it's absolutely vital, is to get the trays. Oh, that says it's out of order. Oh, careful, careful, careful. Very hot. Get the trays and the fat really, really hot, and you need to have enough fat. And the most interesting thing for me about roasting potatoes, or indeed roasting any vegetables, is that we never talk about basting. Do you talk about basting anyone in your recipes for roast vegetables? Well, basting's much sure. Oh. Uh, we just need to go down to 210, please, sir. If, if not, then we've had a lot of tries of that, so maybe. Uh, don't worry too much. So that's the Desiree's gone in, and over here is the King Edwards. Thank you, guys. Can you, if you just leave those there, actually, because we may well use them again, so there's no need to wash them up. Coming through, hot pan, guys. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, no worries. That's lovely, thank you very much. Now, the pasty. See, I have these, and I always have these for everything now. These are heat proof brushes, they're the most magnificent thing. But you think about it, we talk about basting the chicken, but you don't really need to baste the chicken for a different lamb. It's got plenty of fat, it does it itself. But a vegetable, a carrot, a potato, any sort of potato's got no fat. So of course you need to baste it. You know how you have the little black ends on things? Well, if you baste it, you don't get those. And obviously it just uh, affects the temperatures, uh, the temperatures because you need to open the oven a little bit more, but you do need to baste. And these are the most extraordinarily wonderful things. Because the other thing is, of course, that you have. Um, it's just very, very easy. You just take it up, get the fat, go over the top a few times, and you get a much, much nicer result. Also, a key thing when you're dealing with, um, oh, this is very interesting here. Yeah, okay, we're gonna have to taste, taste this later on. Just going back to the mash. So you're all there with the roasties? So you're in charge um, of basting. This is my favorite brush. My wife gave me this brush for my birthday, okay? 
I'll let you use it, okay? So you need to take them out about every five minutes for about the next 15 to 20. And give them a good old brush, turn them over a little bit. But what you need to do as well is you need to let them harden first of all. And there's this thing, um, if you just, so if you go go it in about seven minutes first of all. There's this thing that I affectionately call the man shake. You know how a man comes into a kitchen? Where's my keys? Where's my wallet? And they have to shake a pan. There's a pan handle there, they just have to shake it. Now, this is a problem in lots of ways with a lot of things. Because, of course, when you've got something in a pan like this, if you've got something in a pan, say it's the sauteed potatoes or you've got the roast potatoes there, the temptation is always to start stirring or turning or mucking about with it straight away. But there, it's bad because what you're doing is you're taking the heat out of the pan. And this is extremely important in the case of roast potatoes where you don't want them to break up and all go crazy. You have to let them settle and get that crust on top. Now, we're briefly going to revisit the mash. But before I do that, just so I come in on time here, we need to get... Have you used one of these before? Okay, do you want to grab a grater then? I think. The grater's probably better for this side anyway. So here, you see on the left-hand side... I didn't bring that grater on it. Left here. This is a lovely smooth mash. It all happened very quickly. It's a delightful texture. This, so that's with the... Um, with the... Sorry? No? Yes, to zero. There we go. Okay. But close. Closer than Charlotte. Because this is with the Charlotte. Okay? You see here, it's bouncy, it's lumpy, it's gone through the same sieve, it's the same amount being cooked at the same time. Okay? So this is a this is a really, really interesting sort of scenario because the other thing was when you're cooking mash that I didn't mention, it's very important to cook it in plenty of water. Because of course you need to disperse it all the Okay, and if you're put, otherwise you're just kind of boiling the glue, if you like, back in. Okay, so that's our mash is on the go. Once we've got a few pans spare, if you could just grab a couple of pans that we could use for buying, and uh, pop my king from on top of each of those ones so that we can keep them nice and warm later. They will need that. Good. Okay, so next. Everyone, everyone there on the roast? Any questions on the roast? I used uh, goose fat, actually. Um, but I think for me, that's not as vital as it is for most people. Um, and that if you have it, there is no question that goose or duck fat gives you, for me, the most magnificent results. Like, there's no question about it. It's also apparently very healthy, you know, relatively speaking. Like in the southwest of France, where they kind of live on it, they live longer per capita than anyone else anywhere in the world. Um, but so I, I think that taste is good. But I think, certainly in terms of the types of recipes that I do these days, I would not that often suggest using that as a first thing because it's one of those ingredients that I think often people say. I'm talking about everyday type of recipes here. People see it, they go, "Oh, it's one of those recipes." Do you see what I mean? So I think I think you know the, the, these are the things where you can get a fantastic roast potato done in. Uh, nonsense oil, vegetable oil, anything like that. There's absolutely no point using extra virgin olive oil because it just ruins it at those heats and the temperatures you need to get it at. Um, yeah, so that's the that's the end of that. Any, any more questions? I knew we'd met, haven't we, at one of the food shows. Yes, yes, so I was trying to try to picture. Um, Kelly. That's right. Always cut them up and always cut them in uniform sizes. Again, that's very important because if you have some that are larger than others, what ends up happening is that some are overcooked, some are undercooked. And the overcooked ones don't matter so much, the undercooked don't. And actually, I mean, again, you see, this is a thing that, yeah, that's great. So if you get some more water in there, it'll fit in very nicely. If you get, um, sometimes you get these ideal scenarios, like these um, these kind of dream things. Like if I'm making a really beautiful potato gnocchi, I bake the potatoes. You know, I bake them on a thing and then I scoop it out. But to do that, it's hot, and if you let it go cold, it's a bit of a hassle. I've got asbestos fingers, most people don't. So what I'm always looking for in my recipes is I'm not looking necessarily for the perfect thing. Because I generally know that I can do the perfect thing. But I generally know that no matter how clearly I communicate that, unless I've got the person literally right next to me and I'm doing it with them, and even then, you can't necessarily do it. So I think that sometimes it's finding the best. Like, for example, the best way to fry a steak is very slowly in foaming butter. Like you have to keep the butter at such a temperature. It's a thing that you have in, uh, you know, at Rumanwa or somewhere like that, you have one guy who's looking after you. Know? But 
you can get as, almost as good a thing by starting in very hot fat and then turning to butter about halfway through. It's not as good, it's nearly as good. So that's what I always do in my studies. So I think it's that sort of thing. It's, it's finding a, um, a ground. And I'm not talking about dumbing down. I'm talking about giving people confidence, making things accessible, making things. Because I have seen this so many times now. Like when people, they do something, and they do it and it works. I've never made a match like that. That makes them want to try. And that keeps us all working. You know, it's that sort of thing. It keeps us all working. It keeps, it keeps people buying books and reading articles and um, buying books for less than when we started writing books, certainly, but you know, there you go, you can't have it all. Okay, guys, we need some grating done over here, please. Yeah. Um, and we're going to need some frying, too. But first of all, I'm just going to talk about this. Um, I haven't been able to... Have we got a grating, guys? Over here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the same... It's pretty hot. The same variety of potatoes, so both to zero, which were suggested for the cement potatoes, one cement, one water. Now, it's actually not that different, the illustration here. Um, but if you get used to the idea that we're not just always talking to people who know what you're talking about, did anyone watch Jay Builder's program when he was in a house somewhere? And someone said, what does water look like when it boils? Do you remember that? So, I mean, it's, it's, I'm not saying you're necessarily only reaching out to people who don't know what boiling water looks like. So here, my darling, what you need to do, but getting people aware of the difference between boiling and simmering. So you just break these like that as fast as you can possibly do. Stevie, your, your base thing are you? Yeah, good man, okay. Don't fiddle them about too much though. Lovely. And if you create one to the detail there. Getting people aware that there is a difference is important. And it is for these um, uh, it's potatoes. I can't think of another vegetable that you would need to be uh, slightly delicate with. True some other folks, if you ever deal with those, that's very important with those. Um, no, nope, apart from that, I can't think of another. So here, for me, in a way, this is the most important illustration of a language that we haven't really thought enough about. Because you think you get people at home and they're boiling stuff, okay, you've got something they do know what boiling water, but they know what boiling water is all about. So they're boiling, they boil them very, very quickly. So they're all breaking up, like my ones get all of them, that's, that's great. And this is the zero, the zero, lovely. So here, for the actual um, end product that I got with my boil and simmer isn't very um, groundbreaking, I'm afraid. I could boil them a bit longer, just to, for dramatic purposes. I think I can do that, actually, by the time that you taste them, okay. But, it is a very important to me distinction. And I think more than ever, the way that what we do is going, we need to look for ways of helping people get cooking, helping people do more cooking, and helping people get better results. And talking about the language and mixing it, you know, with the, the, the sort of innovative ideas here, I think, you think about how long waxy and flowery have been around. The idea of changing that to fluffy salad and smooth is quite a big deal. It's quite a big deal to you know, move that around. So if within that, you know, we're talking to people and we're looking at the language that we use as well. For example, in Everybody Every Day, something that I noticed over 18 years is that when people follow recipes, like I'm looking at looking at someone, they're doing a recipe, something from them, I know I'm just looking at you, forgetting that you're reading this recipe, you go, pretending that you're reading that recipe. Sentences are generally far too long. Look at these recipes. When you go in the kitchen, you don't, okay, let's, let's do it for the sautés, for example. We can do some sautés with that now. Uh, Okay, if you leave, leave, leave them away, Chief, then uh, we can crank it back up again, I think. You don't get a pan, add some oil, add potatoes, season them with salt and pepper. You don't do that all in one thing, do you? That's fine. So here what I'm talking about is these very short sentences. And what I've done with everybody every day is single sentence tasks. So you get the pan, you add potatoes. And there, all of a sudden, it becomes more achievable because you're doing one thing at a time. And you haven't lost the beginning of the sentence by the time you get to the end. And I think, you know, these are things to look forward to. And these are things, you know, this has been my huge um, privilege of being able to watch people of all ages and all sorts of different situations cook. Now, guys, you need to do that quickly, and then you need to come over here. Where's our hot pot? Are these hot? Not yet, but it will be. Okay, we'll just pop one here. So we're going to do some sautés now. Okay, so we've done roast, we've done simmered, we've done boiled, we've done um, roasters over there, we've done mash, which is over here. And now we're going to talk sauté potatoes. Does anyone have any questions first? If we do, yes, ma'am. Yes. Did you season the salt? Uh, I should have done, but I forgot. But I seasoned in the water that I boiled them in. So 
normally you don't have to do that afterwards, but of course what you would do then, or you would certainly suggest to do then, is taste the potato. Have it sufficiently seasoned at this point, then if not add a bit of salt. But what I quite like too, and I must admit, is this is kind of, I've got to say, you know people, that's great, lovely, thank you very much. You know people talk about becoming addicted to salt. I am utterly certain that I am one of those addicts. I love salt, I just love it. And what I really like to do with any sort of potato is that once it's cooked, I like to sprinkle it with something like mulled salt or fleur de sel. I love that. And I do these little spice salts. Like sometimes I mix my mulled salt with a bit of thyme and a bit of uh, black pepper. Sometimes for a special treat, now this very pot style seasoning of dried orange zest. And I grind some of that up with some savory, some sariette, and some of the salt, and I sprinkle that over the top. And it just kind of changes the nature of the whole thing. So, kids, oh, Stevie, don't you try and get away from me. This is your turn. OK, that's one. Lovely. Because Stevie, over there, volunteered Jess, you see. I said, can I have a volunteer? He said, Jess will do it, so I made sure he was here, too. Good. OK, so over here, we're going to do a couple of things. First of all, I need to get this on, actually. This, as far as I know, I invented this. this next thing. Because there's another example, Roshki. We had to talk about this tonight, of one of the most god-awful things that everyone's followed the recipe for endlessly. Wash the par boiling a potato before you grate it. I mean, what a ridiculous thing to do. It's an absolutely stupid thing to do, but it just keeps getting repeated everywhere in recipes. Why? There's no, I, the reason, I suppose, of doing it is that you do it all in the pan, you fry it. But generally, people have ovens, so you take the said wash the out of the pan and pop it up from it. But what you need to do first of all, you choose the right potato, which is uh, zero. Getting a good bit of press tonight, zero, aren't they? You're saying I'm good. Oh, sorry, mate. No, but the Maris pipes are brilliant. We love, but I couldn't do chips because of the fryer situation. So, but, but I must say that Maris Piper is the one that I've used the most in my life. <laughs> and uh, my mum was born in um, Stockport. Uh, no. What's the next Southport? The one That's before Manchester, okay. somewhere up there, anyway. Yeah. But she left when she was nine. Okay, so what you do is you grate this one, and then you squeeze it. And you see all this stuff that comes out? You've got a good squeeze. That's what gets in the way of your washi being delicious, really. So there you go. That's that done. Then, for this particular recipe, what we're going to do, guys, I need your full concentration here, because you've got three different sorts of potatoes. Here we've got Desiree. Here we've got Maris Piper, which are the ideal ones for... Oh, I love them. I love them for these things. I'm sorry, I feel like I've been neglecting you. It's a terrible thing to do, isn't it? Okay, good. And then, so, what you're going to do, guys, is pop these in the pan. Pull them closer to you. You're going to be in charge of the pan over here. And um, away you go. Don't crowd the pan. Okay, we're going to start sauteing them away cheerfully, okay? I'm going to do the washi over here, so you guys don't need to think about that. It does need to work, absolutely. Put some ducks in the pan. Okay? Thanks. Give us some food. Okay, good. So you're going to sauté this away, Jeff, in a nice even layer. Now these heats are very fierce, guys. So what you want to do, and this is the thing as well, playing your piano here, is, and this is your variety, and that's your variety over here. Uh, there's flippers just there. But the thing is too, when you're sautéing potato, sauté means to chop. Sauté is done, like that. The sauté potatoes I, I, t I, I tend to do should be leave on the tip top me. So I just turn them over. Because the thing about jumping them all around and carrying on, if you want a lovely potato on either side, Right, you're going to have to have a potato that spends roughly the same amount of time on either side. If you're faffing about being a man shape all the time, it's never going to happen. The other thing is, what's going to happen is that you're going to have half of a... Um... Good, when you do it, go very gently, and it's lovely, it's like all that George should be. You know, they said finishing the lines, so you need to do this, and then always away from yourself like that. And don't, no, 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 just leave it. When you put it in, just, just, just leave it, okay? That's the fiddling I was talking about, just leave it. Okay, put the puree in now, so you swap that with that, nice and close. Because the other thing is, you don't want a fierce heat all the time. It's like this business of everyone cooking fish with skin on over a very fierce heat. Another thing drives me crazy, everyone does it that way because it's always been done over a high heat. It's the worst thing you can do to get a good skin piece of fish. The same thing with a spud, because you want the crust to build up around the outside. You want the potato to become thick enough so you have a lovely inside. There's a whole lot of things that can make something nice into something absolutely glorious. And we can tell people that stuff. It's up to us to tell them that stuff. Otherwise, who's going to tell them that stuff? It's a terrible thought to know that stuff. Okay, kids, that's good. And then pop these in. These are Charlotte's, because actually, I must say, these weren't included on the brief. But these are my favorites to do sautés with. I do a lot of stuff with Charlotte's. Not quite as much as I do with, um, with Maris, obviously, but you know, a bit. Okay, so that's one half of my spuds there. Now, over here, I've got some soft, sweet, sticky onions. I'm going to pop them in the center. Okay. Okay. These are just, um, you know, car car caramelized onions. A bit of grated cheddar. Can you pop on the salamander for me, 
two kids. Please, for the greater cheddar, there we go. And then, and this is the thing that you didn't know about before, maybe you did, but this is the second layer. This for me is the ultimate thing to use up leftovers with. I did this recipe in a, as, a, as a thing in my a section of everybody every day called slow cook sorcery. When you create leftovers on purpose, so you can do things like this using them up. And what I do is I use the um, the bit of the chicken. You know how when you've done your chicken, and I show a show where carving it to get six portions. But then after you've got your six portions, you go with a spoon around the carcass, and you can get between 110 and 140 grams of chicken from that carcass. Now you guys start your business, doing a little thing, you know, going on, that's a little sandwich at lunchtime, that's star food, that's something like that. Think about that. But us at home, that means you, effectively, you're getting eight portions out of the chicken, which may mean, with a bit of luck, you know, it's all very well to tell people why free range and do all that sort of thing, but you've got to look at ways to make it economical, because then you can make, you've got six portions from the roast chicken, first of all, you've got like another couple of portions from the carcass, then you make a stock with the carcass, and then you make a wish for the wishbone. So you get about 10 good things out of it, okay? Good. Now, so here, and see, this is another thing. Who has read recipes at any stage where you start with oil and butter together? You know what I mean? It's nuts. Because they do two different things. Right? So if you want to have oil that doesn't, that if, you, if you want something to fry beautifully, you start in oil and then you add butter later on. And the point being that when you start, this is meant to be little knobs, guys, put it on the outside. So um, the, the, the salamander ruined that for me. Guys, can you pop this in the oven, please? Uh, these are two I prepared earlier. From, these are from a uh, Yes, they are. And there's a zero one on top, it's okay. So there, you let the butter go around the outside, and the oil, what the oil has done there, is it's, it's allowed you to have it hot enough for the potatoes to go in and for them to stick. Okay, what the butter does, okay, you need to press this down as well, it's the other thing. Because the thing is too, once you start getting excited sometimes when you're doing a recipe, you go, oh yes, and you forgot to save your notes and all that sort of thing, but here you need to really press it, give it some money, okay? Okay guys, they're ready for a turn now, you've got some tongs here, okay, just, oh, that's not a very nice thick pan, oh, there we go, no, they're not ready for a turn, they're not ready for a turn, and they're, not, they're nearly ready for a turn, okay? And what we're going to do is we're going to turn them, drain off the fat, and then add some butter, okay? The butter's here are nice little holes. Jolly good? Okay, here, should we have a bit of fun? Because you're about almost falling asleep, aren't you? So let's, um, let's see if we can flip it. What do you reckon? By the way, the way, the way that I worked out, I'll just show you, the way that I worked out to do this, which is the easiest for anyone doing it at home, is you go like that. Like that. Ah, no, not like that, sorry. On, the, on this, I was going to flip it, so I didn't quite work that out. And then you go down to sort of the level. And this is good. If you're ever writing a recipe too for a tap, 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 you notice the thing, you always get to the end, you go, turn it out. Well, thanks, you know, if you've never done it before. And I, I, I used to do it at the uh, Lubana Fair. Uh, we used to do ta ta ta, uh, sometimes I would get everyone doing a different variety. And of course, the bit, it's all about that confidence in the last bit. So here, the thing to do is just to get it at a side where you can easily deal with it. And at a height, you can easily deal with it. And you'll just turn it onto a flat one. And then hopefully you do it with one that doesn't have sides, and you don't make it quite so tricky for yourself, so I've done it here. But luckily I've got my big Tokyo slice, and then it goes back into the pan. Whee! Okay. And then you tuck it in around the edges. And see at this stage, you crisp it up on top, and then you pop it back in the oven. Oh, sorry, this came for the first time. And this again was the Desiree. And it's very interesting doing this too, because you see, this was the ideal variety for this. But as it looks, the colour from the um, King Edwards is extremely good too. So it may be that um, in this case, the variety doesn't matter as much. But my point is with this, if we're testing recipes, if we're doing it properly, Mitzi alluded to this earlier, if we're testing recipes, we've used the spot. And on that packet, it's got the name of the spot. But how often do you not see the name of the spot? And until it really gets in you know, people's uh, imaginations, if you like, that we have, that's beautiful. Look at this. See that? That was the first one. Okay, we want all to look like that. Here, please. For our esteemed audience here. Okay, so you give that a little um, tiny touch of butter on the outside again. And then if you have a pan like this, that is um, got a, wood, a metal handle rather, you can just pop it straight in the oven. Okay, we'll give them a little taste in a sec. Now, you see here, Wonderful patience. That's how old are you guys? 17. Oh, well, I, I was patient like you when I was 17. Of course I was. I'm still not quite that patient now. 
But again, it's about sort of having the patience. And here, not going at a too high temperature. If you go with this, or with fish with a skin on, which is another one of my bugbears, you go with that at a too high temperature first of all. What happens is that you don't get time to get the crust. So you may get the colour, but you don't get what's really, really exciting about it. Because here for me, you know, um, thinking about the, 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 if you like, the exchange of textures. So you're going through something that's really white, it's nearly, hard is not a very uh, nice word to return it. It's, it's crunchy, and there's a sort of depth to the crunch. And then you bite through that into the softness. Okay, it's a little bit salty. It's not crisp. I, I really worry about how often we all use the word crisp because very few things actually are crisp. Um, it's not crisp. You're going from crunchy to soft. It's like a crisp top grata. If you've got breadcrumbs on top, it's crisp. Okay, fair enough. But if you have cheese on top, it cannot be crisp. It's not possible. But who said you always say crispy top grata? So what people are doing at home, they get like that, and then they get it down and they sort of can't crack it. They think, oh, it's not crisp. I haven't done it right. I'm no good. I'll never do it again. So again, it's about the language. So this is the language of the kitchen. Oh, they're looking good, aren't they? Looking good. Okay, give them a little, little bit. Well, do they need any more of base? Was it something I said? Yes, it was. All of it. All right. Well, there probably, you go. No, probably. Well, they're looking good. Yes, correct. Right. Okay, which, one, which ones were these? They were the ones under that. Uh, King Edwards. Okay, good. Sorry? By looking at them. Oh, I'll tell you what, I, I can barely remember my kids' names at times, so, you know, let, 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 let alone the spots. Am I going to a finish by now? Ten minutes. Okay, I've got ten minutes. Good. Okay, we've got ten minutes more. So what do we want to do? We've got the grass omelet to do and a bit of potato salad. Okay. So I get the pan over there somewhere on my side. Okay. Okay. Potato salad. I love potato salad. Potato salad is one of those things. It can be the best thing and it can be the worst thing. Now here I've done it in two different ways. And I wasn't going to do this actually, it was just because I remembered it at the last minute. But the thing about a potato salad, if you don't tell your readers to put their potatoes into the dressing while the potatoes are still hot, then their potato salad will not be nice. Or anywhere near as nice as it can be. How many times have you had you look at the salad and it's, it's got a room of aioli and it's looking great, it's got shallots and cornichons and all sorts of parsley and wonderful things that you're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you bite into it, it's creamy, but all of a sudden there's this cold, unseasoned spud on the inside and you just want to spit it back onto the table. This is because it hasn't been marinated when it's hot and it really is a very easy thing to do. The other thing is that if you're doing a potato salad with its skin on, you have to cut the potatoes before you cook them. For a potato salad. Okay? Because if you don't, what's going to end up happening? Of course, the dressing can't permeate in the same way. It just can't. So you cut them in half, you cut them in slices, and it's a whole thing, you know, I see that, oh yeah, potatoes out, bit of oil, and that doesn't work. This is another way, by the way, folks, and this is a special treat, actually, because I did this the other day. I've got this fantastic private client in um, Nottick Hill. I do one-on-one -on -one cookery classes with. And the other day, we did a whole pig, and, um, and wild mushrooms and truffles, he wants us to do. So, this truffle set is one that I had, I'm not doing the truffles tonight, unfortunately, but, uh, they weren't good enough. I just had them with my eggs this morning. Um, sorry, but I'll still do this. Um, but, um, but this truffle salad I had, I just remembered too. That, um, so what you do is you boil the potatoes in the skins like this, and then you take them off while they're still hot. So this is very, very work intensive because you need to do both things. So you take them off while they're still hot, so they've got this lovely smooth surface like that. So I got Sylvia to do that, and she really enjoyed the experience that you can do this way. And then what you do, so you almost go backwards this way. I think it's very exciting because then you take this and you're a bit of salt, a bit of pepper, there you go. Sorry, you've got one, don't worry. Some extra virgin olive oil. And that's what we're going to do. We're not going to be too fast. You can always put a little more fat on, mate. See, these are, these are looking great, actually. And see, this is, it. this is in the fat. This is a good illustration of what we're talking about before. So these are fried in the goose fat. It is nice, isn't it? There's no question about it. You do this, something that you get that you don't get with any other sort of fat. And then what you do, you see, is you go to your aluminium foil, or well, they can just about come out those uh, orange leaves in a sec. You go to your aluminium foil, you pop it over the top. So the one that I had for that, it had truffles in it too. So then you pop that, and then you put it in the oven for a bit. You put it in the oven for a bit so it all heats up. And that way, of course, it heats up while you're drawing. Goodness me. Were you up out late last night? That is the problem. That is nice what we like to That's good. Good. Well done. Okay. Are they hot? I feel it. 
Right. So we'll pop that in the other two. Now it's getting a little bit overloaded. So now we have to pretend a little bit, but pretend we shall. So these are freshly cooked now, my little Charlotte's. And by the way, Charlotte's, I think this is the one where it's kind of easiest to tell people, but it's something I still really don't get. And I should ask a combination of I think all of you people else. You know what we're talking about? Because it's not just about this, too. Of course, you know, when people were dealing with any sort of small potato, always think it's a new potato. But that's not necessarily true, is it? Um, and what's a, you know, when does the main crop come to it, or an, an early, you know, th these sorts of things. So we've got all these other kind of layers of language and which ones we think are necessary. Because I have to say, although I love, you know, I could spend hours debating in the south of France whether it should be, um, a long boost should be included in a queer base or something like that. Um, I think that there are certain layers of language that we need to avoid as well, perhaps at the beginning, so that people become interested, so that people want to sort of build up their knowledge, rather than trying to give them everything at once. Because I know that when I started teaching, which was 18 years ago, and it was at the moment what gets us on, I was very young, and I'd always, well not always, but the last four or so years I've worked in very fancy restaurants. And what I did is I spent a year showing off, because I didn't know how to teach. I did all this stuff, you know, I did all this stuff, and layers, and height, and all these things. But I had no idea really how to show people what they could do. It was all about showing them what I could do. And I think all of us in our different ways should give them a bit longer, I think those ones just in the air, just pop back, just so we can um, get people. No, we can put them back in there. Okay. So I think the thing is too that sometimes we get almost more concerned about how much we know and how much we think we have to share rather than actually what the reader needs. And I think this is a key thing to consider in the language that we use as well. Because that's certainly and I know this, this is not, for me, this is not in any way ambiguous. I know this from talking to these many people that I've talked to over the years. They just get lost and lose interest. You know, there's a certain point, but you can always choose to go further. And that's, you know, it's, it's important too, I think, that it's wonderful that we all do different things. And we all do different things in different ways. Yeah, no, they're looking great. So if you just um, pop them on the, I think, ah, we'll put them on plates now. No, we'll pop, pop them back on this tray so that we can heat them up. And then maybe just do another, is anyone hungry? <laughs> huh? I just don't uh, you know yeah, the saute spuds are always going. So the reward for standing through this like hour or so with me yapping away like some sort of demented uh, bull terrier is saute potatoes with aioli. <laughs> because the actual the thing is right, if you really want your readers to be happy, okay, all you ever need to do is start with potatoes and add either bacon, cheese, or aioli. Yeah. Okay, it's as simple as that. Or cream, garlic. I left out the garlic today, actually. Okay, so what you do now? This is this is no matter whether you're going to put a creamy dressing on top. You need to have undergarments, if you like. You need to have a dressing underneath your creamy stuff. Your creamy stuff's never enough for a spot. It's never ever enough. Okay, it doesn't matter. You can have barbecue. You can do whatever. With it. You have to do this business first of all. The other thing is. Do you always say, for example, like when you're, when you're doing potato salad, the worst thing you can do is tell people to put it in a bowl. Because they might put it in a bowl that's like this, you know, that's really, really high, like this. You want to put it in a shallow container, a shallow bowl. These are bits of language we need to use as well. So that you can toss it, turn it, without breaking them up. It's a really important thing. Now, people think about, you know, the, the thing about being exact, being precise, makes recipes very chefy, very... Um, very uh, inaccessible. It's exactly the opposite when people go to do it. Give them the information. Put your fun bits in the instructions by all means, you know, you go with that. But a recipe is a series of instructions. The other thing is that we don't consider, like I've been cooking professionally in all sorts of different scenarios for 26 years. When I do someone else's recipe for the first time, I find it hard. I find it hard because I've never done it before. Why would there's this assumption that because it's cooking, you can just do it, chuck it together and, and, and you know, get on with it. But it's not you doing something for the first time. People don't put you behind the wheel of a car and say that. You know, okay, just drive me to you know Oxford. I don't. I've failed my theory test five times. So uh, you know, that's five. Analogy there. Don't laugh. Yeah. Um, okay, they're good. If you pop them on top, then thank you, mate. And I'll give this one over here. <laughs> See, here we've had a slight mishap because the shelf only goes through half of the other. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> now, luckily.
Secondly, we all have our favourite word to use when something like that happens with the recipe. Make it nice and mustard. <laughs> okay, let's see. Now that's too much salt. <laughs> Tiny touch, because you see, the vinegar is a seasoning too. And at this stage, So you've got those, you've got those, you've got those, you've got those, you've got these. So, well, I don't even know what we were doing just then. We were doing what we were doing. Okay, next. <laughs> next is the gratins. Okay, so I've got two varieties here for the gratin. Gratin and gruyere. Gratin and gruyere. Now, there's no question about it for me. A gratin is one of the great things in the world to eat. The recipe that I use. It's one where you do most of it on top. Because you need a variety here in spots that is going to cook for you and it's going to release enough goodies so that it becomes kind of creamy almost all on its own. I do a mixture of cheese and of, um, sorry, not cheese, of um, cream and of put a bit of clean fat in there first and you yeah. wipe that out with a bit of paper. I do a mixture of sorry, cream and milk. So we started off in milk. Normally I put garlic. I haven't put garlic today because we were just sort of speaking about the potatoes. Okay, then I cook it on top. This has been cooked for an awfully long time. I pop in about half of the cheese at this stage. Then once it's all creamy like that, so this is the Maris Piper, which is he's gone. No, there he is, which is fantastic for this. But the interesting thing while doing this actually, and thinking about the variety of potato, I'm not sure that when you make this and you served it to someone like this, almost no matter what had happened to it, they would still love it. So, here we go. And then you put the second half of the gruyere over the top. And you can use some cheddar, but I think a sort of gruyere or a conte or something like that is more, um, excuse me, not to go. You've got to go too. Oh, no, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Well, then I'm lovely to meet you. Well done, Mike. Well done. Okay, so that then goes under the grill. So that's the zero. I just need to remember to mark the next one, which is the... No, sorry, that was the Maris Piper. This is the zero. But the other thing is, too, folks, um, something that I know that people love when you're dealing with recipes is to... Um, Give them things they can do in advance. You know, this is massively important to everybody. They want to know stuff they can do in advance. They want to have things that they can freeze. This is one of those. If you do it on top like that, it's so brilliant and beautiful and fantastic just to have that in the freezer for when you come back sometime. And I, I have a little invention that I do with this, which is, um, you know, when you get home really late and generally some sort of roadblock or something like that has been involved. The next day is much closer than you think, but you have gratin dolphin white in the freezer. You do that, and then you fry some bacon and eggs, and you have that on top of the gratin dolphin white. And all of a sudden, life seems a lot more manageable. <laughs> so then you kind of have everything. You have the potatoes and the cheese and the bacon, and all you need is a bit of aioli on the side, but who can be bothered making mayonnaise at that time of night, you know? <laughs> Good. So that goes under there, that goes under there. The other thing is I tend to sort of bake this afterwards, or I used to bake this afterwards. In fact, in the recipe that I've got that I use today, I've got it baking afterwards, baking this a little harder. But I no longer do. It's one of those things I just do it on the top, pop it on the grill with the egg. It's like, I need to be the best example for how long we've been super lazy with recipes. Macaroni cheese. You think about the illogical thing of taking something made with flour and putting it into a sauce made with flour and then 99% of people who make it, it goes stodgy. It's just wrong. So, everybody that I discovered that you, of course, you cook macaroni like you do risotto. Beautiful. And then you stir in some mustard by me. You pop it in your gratin dish. You sprinkle cheese over the top. You put it under the grill and it never sets. It remains creamy underneath and beautiful. It's much, much quicker, it's much more delicious, and it's probably much better for you. But it's these things, it's searching for these things all the time, using this language, but, and just asking questions of recipes. Because it's been done forever, doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean it's right, and we can all do this, and we can all get people really excited about eating these things. Now, 
I think I've got myself thoroughly overexcited, don't you, Jess? My wife's called Jess. So I'm done now. What I'm going to do is I think you guys are going to finish up and say stuff and, um, and things. I uh, know, but I need five minutes now just to and make it all nice for you. Okay? You can. What's that? I did, yes. And um, no, I, the special thing is almost done. I'm just going to toss them with some vinegar and uh, salt and pepper. Yes. No, I talked about the truffle one, but the thing is, it's just a lovely way, another lovely way of doing it. There's something very lovely about those potatoes when you deal with them and peel their skin off. Maybe it was just something for me. <laughs> but it is really lovely for me. Well, you can try. You can try. But it is. It's um, yeah. Sorry, there's nothing else really happens to them unless you wanted to. Like you take them out and then generally you put something in there with them that could take great value from being in the oven for that time. So obviously that rules out soft terms, you know. What would be lovely in there um, if you didn't fancy truffles would be um, you could have some um, some porcini, but not fresh ones, dried ones, just reconstitute a little bit. Or you could have some um, dried orange zest, just dried like that in there. Or roast garlic would be sublime as well. 